All right, well, thanks for joining me today for our presentation on marine diesel engines and uh, heavy marine fuel oil additive treatment options. I am Eric Bjornstedt. I'm the Technical Information Director with Bell Performance here in Central Florida. And we're going to be discussing the topic of large marine diesel engines and the additization treatment options for the heavy fuel oil that are that's used by those large marine ships. So uh, in our time together today, what we want to cover is we want to talk about, first of all, uh, well, in total, the major considerations that are entailed in talking about marine fuel oils, uh, their properties, <clears throat> the problems that the, the marine fuel oils can cause for the end user, and then the options that we have uh, that may serve as solutions for those problems. Uh, so uh, when we break it down into subtopics, we're going to talk about marine fuel oils. We're going to talk about the uh, the pre-combustion fuel issues that they have. Uh, we're going to talk about combustion problems, uh, you know, problems that that manifest themselves during the actual burning of the fuel itself. And then, of course, we're going to talk about post-combustion fuel concerns, of which there are several. Uh, and with respect to all of these, we're going to talk about what causes them and what the possible solutions are for those. And then, of course, uh, when you're talking about solutions, uh, we want to do some clarifications on what you should look for in the best kind of solution for the specific one that you're considering. So to get started, uh, we want to go back to the beginning by considering marine fuel oil itself and how it's made, and then see what implications can come out of that. So um, <clears throat> marine fuel oil itself is created from blending secondary residual fuel components of crude oil, uh, blending those with cutter stocks. Now, uh, as depicted by this graphic here, you can see there are a number of different uh, uh, things that come out of the crude oil that can go into marine fuel oil. You've got these kind of things here. You've got long residues, straight run gas oils, short residues, uh, vacuum gas oils, cycle oils, uh, residues that come out of the viz breaker, uh, gas oil that comes out of the viz breaker. And uh, all of these kinds of things can go into the marine fuel oil. Now, uh, the marine fuel oil's characteristics depend on first and first of all on the origin of the crude oil itself, uh, and also on the kinds of refinery processes. Excuse me, the kind of refinery processes that are employed to make it, uh, and these characteristics, the characteristics of marine fuel, they impact how the fuel behaves during combustion, and then the problems that it brings with it. Now. When crude oil is processed, it gets uh, split into different classes of products like uh, gasoline, uh, LPG, diesel fuel, number one and number two, um, and, and the like. Now, uh, gasoline and number one and number two diesel fuel oils, those are distillate fuels. Uh, the heavier things like uh, number six heavy fuel oil, those are considered residuals. Now, historically, if you go back to say the 1970s, historically, they would get anywhere from 50 to 65 percent distillate content from each barrel of crude oil that was refined. But today, because of the prevalence of 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 the of different kinds of of processes uh, and and uh, processing technologies, we'll say today it was closer to 90-10 or even 93-7. And that means that today we only get maybe 7 to 10% of the crude oil volume comes out as residual product. And when we talk about residual product, that includes heavy fuel oil and the kinds of things that go into heavy marine fuel oil. And the fact that we're getting a lot less of it today so, you know, what we were getting in 1970, well, that impacts the characteristics and the properties of marine fuel oil. Now, this is a table that lists the typical properties of heavy marine fuels in use today. Now, you can see that all of these uh, types of different types of, of heavier fuels, RME25, uh, RMF, RMG, uh, uh, RMH, RMG35, all of these have uh, important properties that are necessary to be adhered to. 
uh, density and kinematic viscosity, well, these affect the energy value of the fuel, and also they affect how the fuel gets atomized into the combustion chamber. Density is also important because when you're purifying marine fuel oils before use, you typically run them through centrifuges. And uh, the fuel, in order to to be successful and effective in doing this, the marine fuel oil must have a density that is actually sufficiently different from water in order for this to work. Now, sulfur content, well, sulfur content is important uh, and it's regulated or specced uh, for both environmental reasons and also as a hedge to prevent corrosion within the system. Maximum sulfur content in the open ocean for fuels that are burned in the open ocean is about three and a half percent since January 2012. Uh, when you get closer to shore within uh, the, the, the buffer zone, so to speak, it goes down to 0.1%. And this is a relatively new restriction that's been in place since uh, the beginning of 2015. Now, these ones here, total sediment potential and ash percentage, those matter because um, those affect the, the inner or the, the non-combustible portions of the heavy fuel oil. If they're too high, then you may risk uh, forming too much sediment and also forming too much ash uh, after combustion. Um, flash point, flash point down here uh, affects the combustibility of the fuel. Now, in all of these, uh, they all have a minimum of 60, six, and that's 60 degrees centigrade. That's because the flash by regulations the flash point of any fuel that's used in a ship's engine room must be at least 60 degrees centigrade so that you reduce the risk. The, basically, you reduce the fire hazard that's inherent with that. Now, uh, these here, vanadium content, sodium content, aluminum, iron, nickel, calcium, magnesium, all of these are listed because these all, all relate to the inorganic content of the marine fuel oil. Now, uh, aluminum and silicon, they uh, are directly related to uh, the abrasiveness of the fuel as well as to its ash producing characteristics. The aluminum and silicon value is used also to check for if, there's, if there are remnants of any uh, of the catalyst that was used at the refinery during catalytic cracking processes. Now, most of these uh, catalysts that are used at the refinery, they contain either aluminum or silicon. And so if, if these figures, if these measurements for the particular fuel are unusually high, well, that will tell the analyst that they may not have cleaned that fuel up uh, appropriately. Uh, and if these are excessively high, well, the consequences to that could be, you know, you could cause damage to the engine if there is excess aluminum and silicon. So, the properties of the marine fuel oil do have an impact or do have an influence on how it performs and are a determining factor or a contributing factor in how likely a particular batch of fuel or a particular kind of fuel oil is, is how likely it is to cause problems. So uh, it is this likelihood that we should explore. Now. Um, as we said before, marine fuel oil is made from secondary refining products of crude oil. In other words, the residual leftovers. Now, uh, because it is because it's made from the residual leftovers, essentially, uh, marine fuel oils can tend to be prone to a number of different kinds of issues. Again, remember from from our summary at the beginning, we're we're going to be talking about pre-combustion issues, combustion issues, and post-combustion. Now, if you've been in the marine industry for any length of time, this is not the first time you've heard of this. This is probably old news to you. So. The kind of problems uh, that we want to run down, you can get things that can get sludge formation in the tanks because of precipitation of asphaltines. Asphaltines is something we'll talk about uh, in a little bit more depth, but basically one problem that can come out of storage of the, of the uh, marine fuel oil is just too much dropout and too much sludge formation in the storage tanks and the day tanks, things like that. Uh, the, this second point here, blocking of filters and centrifuges, well, that actually relates to this one. If there's too much or there's excessive sludge formation, not only will it drop on the tanks, but it will also block filters and it will excessively block centrifuges. You can get for poor fuel atomization. 
Uh, you can get poor ignition and combustion of the fuel, which is definitely a problem. Uh, you can get damage to fuel pump. You know, areas of the, the both the, the engine in the combustion area uh, and also uh, in the pre-combustion area. Um, if you have any of these problems, that can lead to an increased frequency of having to change injectors and overhaul other parts of the engine, which means your maintenance budget is inflated. Um, and then, as you continue to drill down into the problems with marine fuel oils, well, then you can start talking about things like high temperature deposit problems and erosion of exhaust valves and turbocharger fouling and fouling of other areas like a, a, uh, exhaust gas economizers. Uh, and then, of course, general problems like excessive pollution because the, um, the, the fuel emissions are out of whack. And even something as elementary as an incompatibility problems because you've had to mix a couple of different kinds of fuel in the same storage tank. So all of these problems in these past three slides, you know, they all stem from the characteristics of the marine fuel oil. And so as we list each one of these off, there's one question that comes to mind is, how much you know how much pain does each of these kinds of problems cost how much do each of these individual problems if you're a ship operator uh, you may already have an idea at least a general idea of how much each one of these might cost you as a ship owner operator you know how much does turbocharger fouling cost you know how does that impact your maintenance budget how does um, having to take special precautions and change things around in order to get the, in order to meet emissions uh, regulations. How much does that cost you? So, you know, it should be pretty evident that users of fuel oil, they have, you know, they have a lot of issues to contend with if they're going to use that. So let's take a couple of these and look at them a little bit more closely. Uh, and since uh, uh, it's as good as any to start with, let's start with pre-combustion considerations. Specifically, let's start with marine fuel oil stability. Now, when we talk about uh, terms here, it's good to know the exact meaning of what we're talking about. So when we talk about stability, right, we are going to be talking about uh, what we mean, the, the fuel's ability to resist change in its properties as a function of time and temperature. And then when we talk about compatibility issues, well, then we're talking about the ability of, of a couple of different fuels to remain stable when they are blended. Now, the reason why we bring these up is uh, fuel instability and fuel incompatibility uh, Related to asphalt heat. In other words, instability and incompatibility are directly correlated with the fuel's makeup. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, first thing we have to realize is that if you take a stable marine fuel oil, a, a particular batch of marine fuel oil or MFO, that is, you know, it's 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 got a pretty high stability score if you run it through an ASTM test. Uh, one thing that you will notice if you were able to take that and break it down is that stable fuels tend to have a relatively high resin to asphaltine ratio. Now, uh, there's that word again, asphaltines. All petroleum, you know, starting at the crude oil level, all petroleum contains some amount of asphaltine molecular content. Now, asphaltines are well, what we would call, as a chemist, we would call them hydrocarbon macromolecules. Now, all that means is they are really big hydrocarbon molecules, and they have a lot of carbons in them, um, and they've got hydrogens, because if you remember from chemistry class, carbon is four bonds, and typically, unless there is something like another carbon attached to it or an oxygen, typically, they will most likely be bonded with hydrogens. So, asphaltines are these really large, uh, very heavy and complex carbon molecule, groups of carbons, it's all stuck together, they have a high carbon to hydrogen ratio, and in in uh, petroleum and in fuel, they exist or they coexist with other molecules as micelles, as these packets of asphaltines, and they typically are stabilized by the presence of other things in the fuels, what they would call natural resins in that fuel. So a stable fuel 
has a high resin to asphaltene content. And in a stable fuel, all of these things, the resins and the asphaltene, they're all coexisting in, you know, happy harmony. Now, marine fuel oils that happen to come from uh, petroleum that's been heavily processed, well, that will tend to be un or have a greater chance of being more unstable because the processing affects the resin content. Specifically, if they take that petroleum and they run it through a vis breaker unit, a vis breaker unit is basically a big a big heating furnace where they take the, the the oil and they put it into this furnace and they heat it up uh, with the with the purpose of trying to reduce its viscosity and then thermally crack the large molecules into smaller ones. Basically, what they're trying to do is they're trying to reduce the the amount of uh, residual content that's coming from that that oil and turn it into more profitable stuff like gasoline and number two diesel. And in order to do that, they have to do things like use vis breaking units. So they heat it up and they break the large molecules apart. They get more gasoline, more diesel, you know, more things that they can make more money out of. And the stuff that's left over, the if they try to make marine fuel oil from the stuff that's left over, then more likely than not, that marine fuel oil from that is going to be a lot less stable than marine fuel oils of the past because all that processing destroyed these resins. So it destroyed the things that helped or used to help keep the asphaltines in homogeneous suspension within that fuel. And so this instability that's inherent now with these marine fuel oils that are a result of heavy processing crude oil, this instability typically manifests itself first and foremost as asphaltine dropout. Now, you can see here, we talked about asphaltines being these very large, complex groups of carbon molecules. Well, this is a computer-generated model of what an asphaltine might look like. All these greens here, those are all carbon molecules. So you should just be able to see visually that this is this is going to be, uh, first of all, one that's got a lot of carbons in it. I have no idea how many carbons are actually contained in this, but you've got a lot of carbons in there. Um, you can also see, you know, these are hydrogens here, and you've got some of these others. Uh, uh, you know, the, these might be nitrogens probably. This one's probably a sulfur. Um, but it's a large, complex molecule here. Now, um, asphaltines tend to be one of the largest causes of fouling in uh, marine fuel oil systems, specifically in areas like uh, the heat exchangers. Um, now, as we said, asphaltines are present in crude oil, typically in micelle form. And uh, when that, that crude oil is processed, those micelles tend to get broken down. And when they get broken down because of, you know, vis breaking or some other process, once they get broken down, they essentially, the, 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 they're essentially liberated from being in this micelle and now they're thrust out into the, uh, the, 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 the big wide world of that fuel. And what do they do at that point? Well, the asphaltines, uh, try to seek out other, other asphaltines, and they re-agglomerate. They, re they come back together again, except this time, instead of being uh, in, you know, nice, stable little micelle forms, uh, they now become things, uh, a form that can be a lot more problematic. Uh, and so the polar asphaltines, they agglomerate, and then they do things like they transport themselves to tube walls in an engine or in a, in a, uh, a furnace area. And they stick to these walls and they start to form uh, phalanx layers. And that is never a good thing. So uh, asphaltine content, asphaltines are a contributing factor to the formation of the polymers that make up fuel sludge. Basically, they act like building blocks for that. Now, if you remember, a polymer is simply a made up of just repetitively bonding together a bunch of smaller monomer units together. Well, these asphaltines used to be minding their own business as my cells, but when they were broken apart by processing, 
they all go and they all start trying to stick together again and they start to form these large polymers and it's these large polymers that start that are that that start to manifest themselves as problems. It's these large polymers that tend to cause problems in ways that they didn't before when they were all in my cell form. So one of the things that comes out of this is, you know, given that this phenomenon is true and common in marine fuel oils and in processed fuels coming from heavily processed crude, one of the things that becomes evident is that there is a need to ameliorate or to help blunt this problem by the use of dispersants. Now, uh, dispersants are very useful in solving this problem. Um, you know, when you, you have a lot of secondary refining processes, when you have a lot of things like vis breaking that fundamentally change the marine fuels makeup, make it more prone to sludge formation, this creates the need for use of dispersants and stabilizers. And ba basically, you're, going, you're substituting asphaltine dispersants and stabilizers to take the place of the resins that used to be there before. So you add a dispersant and you add, typically as part of a stabilization package, you add it to the fuel um, and the dispersant keeps the asphaltine molecules apart and keeps them from sticking together, keeps them from acting as monomers in the formation of those large polymers that eventually turn into sludge. So a dispersant quite simply disperses the asphaltines, keeps them apart. So if you use a good dispersant package in your marine fuel oil, what are you gonna see? Well, bottom line is you're gonna see less sludge dropout, you're gonna see less blocking of filters, and you're going to see less uh, 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 problems or less 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 of the the asphaltine showing up as sludge in the centrifuges. And all of those are specific value points that are, can be pretty valuable for a marine fuel oil user. Now, other pre-combustion problems that can you know be seen by a lot of marine fuel oil users. Well, some of these do relate to what we were just talking about: excessive sludge precipitation. Uh, filter blocking from this, centrifuge overload from this. Um, a lot of marine fuel oils uh, can have water content. Uh, and so the water content and the need to have water removal uh, and the formation of emulsions, well, that can be a, pro a pre-combustion problem for a marine fuel oil user. Again, catalytic fines, remember the excessive uh, aluminum and silicon content, you know, the presence of what they call cat fines in the fuel, you know, that can lead to abrasion problems. And then, of course, fouling in areas like the fuel heater, the, uh, the fuel injector tips, uh, of course, poor fuel atomization comes from that. And then just overall abrasive wear, both in the injectors and also in places uh, like the rings. Those are all pre-combustion marine fuel oil problems. Now this here, this is a, you know, a basic schematic of what a typical uh, marine fuel transfer system, what we might call a transfer system, might look like. And one thing you should be able to see here is that as if you take the fuel and you follow its journey from start here in the storage tank to here, the engine, what you should be able to see is that there are a number of different places uh, within this whole system where things like sludge dropout and asphaltine dropout, where things like that can be a real problem. I mean, consider, you know, the fuel starts in the storage tank. It goes to the transfer pumps where you can have problems there. It goes to a settling tank, problems there. It goes to a separator pump, goes to a preheater. Then, of course, those centrifuges. You've already established that there can be excessive uh, uh, asphaltine accum and sludge accumulation in there. Then it goes to another service tank um, through a flow meter to a mixing tank, um, and then eventually, you know, it can be injected into the engine. But there are a lot of different places where uh, fuel sludge, asphaltine sludge, can be a real problem. Now, um, what does it look like? Well, this is a picture of a, a holding tank for marine fuel oil. And as you can see over time, this dark, thick, 
you know, uh, however you want to describe it, this is tank sludge. And uh, so many times it's, it's not uncommon to get sludge buildup in your ship that looks like this. It's also not uncommon to have excessive sludge volumes in your centrifuges. You know, sludge builds up, uh, it has the marine in, in the fuel oil, and that fuel oil has to go through the centrifuges because it wants to be purified before it's injected into the engine. Um, and so, uh, you know, one bottom line with this, you might say, well, you know, so what? You know, a, a centrifuge is, this is what a centrifuge is supposed to do. It's supposed to take out stuff like this. And that's true. That's absolutely true. If you didn't have this centrifuge, I mean, it's not like if you have excessive sludge volume, then you're going to solve it by, well, we'll just take out the centrifuge. Of course, you're not going to do that. But the reason why this matters the reason why we're talking about this is because sludge deposits are lost heating value of that fuel. They started out as part of the fuel. And if, if, if that fuel were to have been left alone, so to speak, you know, let, if it were to be left minding its own business, then all of the carbon content that was present in this sludge, you know, it would have gotten combusted and we would have gotten burned and it would have provided heating value. It would have, it was part of that fuel. It was part of what the customer, i.e. you, it's part of what you pay for when you purchase fuel oil. But if that, slu if that fuel has become unstable because of any number of reasons, such that this centrifuge has to t strip out excessive sludge, well, that's lost heating value of the fuel. It's lost heating value. It's a potential economic loss for that fuel because when you buy fuel oil, you pay for uh, you you know you pay for heating value. And so if you have excessive sludge volume, you know you're not getting that, and that's a problem. Now, um, other you know what kinds of areas in your system can you have? fuel issues, marine fuel issues. Well, you can have them in the viscosity control. I mean, you can see them here. The heaters, different filters, all these different kinds of areas can have pre-combustion problems manifest themselves in. Um, this is an example of a fuel injector tip. Now, remember that we're talking about pre-combustion problems. So we haven't even gotten to combustion problems yet. This is a good example of what we would term ex excessive carbonization of uh, a fuel injector tip. Um, uh, someone else might actually call this either a star deposit or even a cauliflower deposit because of, you know, because obviously what it looks like. Um, if an injector tip gets to looking this way, well, you can probably guess the problems that this is going to cause. It's not going to be, that fuel injector is not going to be able to properly atomize that fuel in the way that it was designed. And if fuel doesn't get atomized properly into a combustion chamber, it's not going to burn anywhere near as well as it's supposed to, and you're not going to get as much efficiency out of uh, that fuel as you were banking when you bought it. Um, this is another fuel injector. This is from 1999 on a Sea Land Express. And as you can see, you can see the, ca the, the cauliflower deposit here. Uh, this ship was probably running a poor quality marine fuel oil, probably had excessively high asphaltine uh, levels. And the reason why it looks like this is because there are very high, uh, there's high uh, pressure involved and there's high heat involved. And these, the, these asphaltines and the sludge that got caught in this tip eventually over time cooked and cooked and cooked and formed this kind of problem. And eventually that injector would have to be pulled and would have to either be cleaned or even worst case scenario have to be replaced. Uh, another kind, uh, 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 another injector from the same kind of ship. Uh, in fact, this is the same ship. It's a different injector. Um, again, you can see deposit buildup in the injector tip here, though it doesn't look anywhere near as bad as uh, the, the, the previous one did. So as an end user, right? You don't want these kind of problems to be there. You want to get rid of these issues and prevent these issues because if they happen to manifest themselves, you're going to have real problems. So therefore, you start to ask yourself, uh, you start to ask yourself questions about what what's the solution and what are the best kinds of solutions.
How do you solve these problems? Well, uh, what we like to do is we like to give you uh, uh, some, some conceptual answers here. We want to give you some characteristics uh, that you should look for when you're trying to select a best practice solution for this kind of thing. And we came up with five things. Um, a, 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 you know, any best practice solution that you might be considering to solve pre-combustion problems like the ones we were just talking about, to solve them in your particular system. Uh, first and foremost, they should be able to stabilize and disperse asphaltine content from the fuel oil. Um, if they do that, then this will follow and this will follow. You will improve the efficiency of the centrifuging. You will improve efficiency of your filtration. You'll reduce fuel slop waste and therefore you will save fuel. You will improve the efficiency of centrifuging if you also are, if it's also able to reduce cat fines as well because these catalytic fines, those aluminum and silicon are not going to get caught up in the centrifuge. Um, and a good best practice solution should enhance the atomization of the fuel oil um, and, and this improve combustion. So um, in, if you're considering a solution like this, you want it to be able to do as many of those things as possible. So that's pre-combustion problems. Okay, now that we know about pre-combustion, we want to move along and start considering problems that might manifest themselves in the combustion zone itself. Now, in order to understand problems in the combustion zone, we have to understand combustion itself. And uh, it can be as complicated as we want it to be. And well, for the purposes of what we're doing here, we're going to say not that complicated. So we're going to do, you know, very simple high-level overview uh, here. Now, at its core, combustion is simply a chain reaction of a bunch of different chemical reactions that are happening very, very, very quickly. You know, split milliseconds here we're talking about. And at its core, combustion involves fuel plus oxygen plus some kind of heat that's inputting to help drive the reaction. A uh, bunch of bonds get broken, and in the end, what you get is you get more heat than what you put in, you get water vapor, and you get carbon dioxide. This is combustion at its down and dirtiest here. Um, fuel plus oxygen yields water vapor, carbon dioxide, and heat. Now, what the when, when you're saying, you know, what when, when you're talking about good combustion, or when you're talking about optimal combustion, when you're talking about success, i.e., what's your goal in burning fuel oil, you want your goal is you want to have as as optimal combustion as, as possible. Uh, so the question that stems from that, of course, is how do you achieve the success? You can't just snap your fingers and make a, you know, make a perfectly combusting system. No, there are things that, that go into uh, a, a, an optimal combustion situation. And those things uh, are in the acronym M-A-T-T. Um, first thing is that in order to have optimal combustion, you need to have a proper optimal mixture of air and fuel. And when we say a proper optimal mixture, uh, one thing that that implies necessarily is that you have the right balance of air and the right balance. You have enough air and, and therefore enough oxygen. You have enough oxygen present to be able to fully combust whatever fuel you're trying, however much fuel you're trying to burn. Um, a, A stands for atomization. In order to have the optimal combustion, you need to have uh, optimal atomization of any liquid fuel. The reason why that matters is because optimal uh, atomization means you're, you're spraying very, very small droplets in there. Essentially, the more complete combustion is possible. Uh, unfortunately, when you start getting those cauliflower injector deposits, that uh, hampers the injector's ability to uh, to atomize that fuel in the best way. And so in fine, uh, very, very small micro droplets that, uh, that the system is designed to be able to burn, you're going to get large droplets, which they're going to burn, but they're not going to burn with the same uh, efficiency as properly atomized fuel will. Uh, you need to have a proper temperature. It means there has to be enough heat, there has to be enough ignition heat 
manifested as the proper temperature of air, um, you, that has to be of a sufficient level in order to help drive these reactions. And then, of course, the other T is time. You have to have the proper amount of time provided to complete the combustion process before the combustion gases come in contact with the heating surface. Now, when you start considering this final T, you start getting into some complicated mechanics of combustion. So we don't really need to go into that in as much detail as we might in other arenas, except just to say that if you don't have enough time, then uh, once those combustion gases come in contact with the heating surface, they're gonna stop combusting. So if you have unburned fuel or, prop, or uh, uh, partially burned fuel in these, then you're going to lose that, that slice of efficiency that, that those uh, combustion gases would be responsible for. So um, the stages of combustion, let's go through those quickly, because in order to, to understand how to improve combustion, you have to understand how combustion works first and foremost. Now, we've just gone through the things that are necessary in order to have perfect combustion. Well, this is what happens uh, during the actual combustion process itself. There are three basic stages of combustion for, uh, we'll say, a fuel oil droplet. This could be a particle of coal. This could be a, a piece of any kind of organic combustible material. But for our purposes, since we're talking about marine fuel oil, we're going to say that this is a droplet of fuel oil. So this droplet has been injected or has been thrust into the combustion zone, so to speak. It's probably in the presence of a flame front somewhere around here. Now, so it's, it's put into proximity of a flame front, and which starts to heat that droplet up very, very quickly. As that droplet heats up, the volatile material that's inside of that droplet starts to evaporate, starts to come out. And um, the, this pre-ignition stage will end with vapor, which is the, the volatile material vapor, when that vapor starts to ignite. Okay. When that vapor starts to ignite, you move to stage two of the combustion, which is, which is the combustion of the volatile components of that fuel oil droplet. So that vapor, uh, which was the volatile components, they all start to burn and they create a flame front um, around that, that droplet. Now, once those are finished combusting, and this happens very, very quickly, once those uh, uh, finish combusting, what you're left with is you're left with some inorganic or inflammable material here. The flame starts to drive away, and you're essentially left with a little molecule of what they might call coke. Now, when the, as the flame dies down, it moves from stage two to stage three, which is combustion of that coke. So um, <clears throat> this coke still contains carbon in it, but remember that all of the easily ignitable or easily combustible volatiles have already burned. Well, you've got this left over. And as the flame dies down, this stuff glows red, and it's still burning here. It's burning at a temperature of about 1,400 to 1,700 Kelvin, very, very hot. And eventually, the combustion will stop, and you'll be left. It's not going to burn within the time frame that you have allotted to burn that fuel. And whatever's left over from there is... In, in combustion chemistry terms, they call that a senosphere. Now, so the summary of the combustion process, uh, the fuel oil a droplet gets injected into the flame front and when it gets injected, there's a delay period, there's an ignition delay. Then it starts to rapidly combust here. As it rapidly combusts, the pressure in the combustion zone changes, it rises pretty rapidly. The rest of the fuel burns as it's finished being injected. And then there you have that after burning period where the remaining unburned fuel, i.e. the stuff, the coking stuff that did not burn immediately, well, it continues to mix with oxygen. It will, whatever that is going to burn, and then you have completed combustion. So um this is how the process works if everything goes as it is supposed to go. 
And ultimately, you know, if you're an operator and you buy fuel oil, ultimately, remember, you're paying for the energy value that that fuel is going to provide and the work that that fuel and that energy value is going to do in combustion. That's what you're paying for. So in order to get the most out of your purchase, you need to have maximum combustion as much as possible. That's essential to your operation. But we know that there are certain things that can happen that can skew combustion away from the optimal. Those things are things like poor atomization of the fuel. We've talked about that. Slow burning fuel, i.e. fuel that's got an excessive amount of, um, shall we say, less flammable organic content. We would term that slow burning fuel. And uh, combustion can be less than optimal if the operator is having to play with the amount of excess air in order to regulate the subsequent acid production. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have optimal combustion, then what kinds of problems can you see? You can see piston fouling and excessive carbon depositing on the piston, premature ring failure, um, cylinder liner wear, um, you know, and fouling of certain parts like scavenge port and uh, deposits under the piston. You can get all of that kind of stuff. Now, what do these problems look like? Now, this is where, see, this is where we introduce this concept of acid deposits, acid droplets, excuse me. Um, this is a picture, uh, this is a combustion problem because this is formed during combustion. Now, um, a problem that may form during a, 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 a combustion is acid formation here. This is what acid, this is the top of a piston. Um, and you can see that there's pitting, there's obvious acid corrosion problems um, on top of what is a very large piston in a diesel marine engine. So that's one kind of combustion problem that marine fuel oil users have to contend with. Um, this is it may, this isn't necessarily the same piston, but it's from the same kind of ship. And you can see this is a this is a fouled piston. Um, you can see uh, uh, you can see uh, up along here uh, definite, very noticeable and prominent corrosion damage. You know, notice how the metal surface here and these metal surfaces around here. Notice how those metallic surfaces have been compromised because of damage that has been done over time. Notice here, these are scavenge port deposits. A scavenge port in a marine diesel engine is where the exhaust gases, i.e. The, the, the newly combusted gases, they're, normally they're forced out of the cylinder through that port. But if those gases contain a lot of acids and things like that, uh, that are a direct result of the marine fuel oil composition, well, you can, over time, get these problematic deposits that form uh, in, in these areas. So what are the, the options for addressing these kind of combustion problems? Uh, remember, we talked about the characteristics of a best practice solution for a pre-combustion problem. What are the characteristics of best practice solutions for combustion problems themselves? What should they be able to do? You know, a best practice solution should be able to do these three things. It should be able to promote an earlier completion of combustion in that cycle, um, <clears throat> which ultimately means you get more out of that fuel, you get less unburned carbon produced. Um, it should contain some kind of uh, combustion catalyst that enhances oxygen transport and results in less unburned carbon. And it should have something in it that cleans the fuel injectors and the pistons and the valves and keeps them free from carbon deposits. Now, when you talk about all these, this is a surfactant package that does this. But what does these here, and which also contributes to this, are these metallic combustion catalysts. Um, a good uh, best practice solution will impact all of these, which typically means it has to contain these. It has to contain organometallic combustion catalysts. Um, those really are the best practice within the industry. You know, you can you can read about things where somebody says, "Well, we have this kind of you know ester, you know gobbledygook, whatever you want to call it." But when it gets down to it, organometallic combustion catalysts are the best practice. 
Uh, they have been shown to be very effective at doing all of this, and the technology for them was done was developed out of research from the 1950s. So they are well they have been well known in the industry for a long time. So uh, if you have unburned carbon, the amount you have uh, correlates to a suboptimal. You remember, optimal combustion means fuel plus oxygen plus heat means more heat plus carbon dioxide plus water. It does not mean soot. So the more soot you have, the more unburned carbon deposits you have. That means that that portion of the fuel did not burn fully, and that means you did not get the most you could out of that portion of the fuel. Um, so if you use a to help solve this well, um, you can make some really significant inroads in this. Now, um, these organometallics, we call them, uh, they came out of a research in the 50s, and I do not remember if it was Dow or if it was DuPont, but it was one of those companies that really started looking at the effect that the presence of certain metallic catalysts had on the amount of, of well, we'll say, had on optimal um, And what they found was that uh, there were certain metals that uh, if you use them, that you could get some significant uh, improvements in there. But what they also found was that if you combined a couple of different ones, you could get a synergistic effect where that, that, that benefit would be actually be multiplied a number of times over. Well, on without good getting too much into the grungy details of combustion chemistry, basically what happens uh, is that if you have these catalysts present in and around the fuel, well, you're going to get a production of greater numbers of these, these OH radicals, so to speak. A radical is simply a chemistry term for, eh, we'll call it an unfinished molecule. Basically, if you were to, let's say, if you were to take a water molecule, you know, H2O, and if you were to split it apart, you get an H and you get an OH. You get a hydrogen and you get an OH radical. Now, nature being the way it is, that OH radical would say, you know, hey, I feel incomplete, and it would immediately go around and look for something to react with in order to, to complete itself. Now, in the context of what we're talking about, if you have more of these, well, you're going to get improved combustion because they essentially, they, they well, I'm thinking of the best way to put it, but, but basically, having more of these makes this entire thing more reactive. We'll just put it that way. Another way that catalytic combustion catalysts work, though, is that they lower the activation energies for the combustion reactions. Remember, combustion is just a chain reaction of, <coughs> excuse me, um, I was hoping I wouldn't sneeze during this, but, you know, best laid plans. Anyway, um, uh, uh, combustion is a series of very fast happening chemical reactions on the breaking of carbon to carbon bonds that yield a bunch of heat. But every chemical reaction, whether it's a combustion reaction or whether it's an acid base reaction or a, a reduction, you know, whatever you want to, to put, they all need some kind of some need more than others, but they all need some kind of energy uh, input in order to make them go. So one thing that organometallic combustion catalysts do is that they lower the amount of energy necessary for a given number of reactions to happen. And what that means for you, the end user, is that you get uh, a greater number of, of combustion reactions happening faster and earlier in the process. And so what that means for you is that you get more heat generated from your fuel earlier in the process. And that is always a good thing. That always means better combustion for your fuel. So we say all of this in order to bring this around to the fact that uh, as Bell Performance, we manufacture uh, AT, the ATX line of fuel treatments for heavy fuel oil. Uh, that have the right combination of combustion catalysts present in them in order to improve or provide the improved combustion that you need. Now, when we say ATX 
MFA, what we mean is that they are, they are ATX multifunctional additives. That means that they contain combustion catalysts. They contain things to address the pre-combustion uh, uh, problems. Uh, they contain surfactants to clean the injectors and all those areas of the fuel delivery system. They do a number of things uh, in one formulation. Now, when you treat heavy fuel oil, combustion catalysts present in ATX, you can see a marked difference in the results that you get. This here, this is a, remember the senosphere, this is a picture of the unburned carbon in fuel oil that was not treated with a combustion catalyst. This is what it looks like under an electron microscope. This is a big, gigantic mass of, of carbon molecules. You can see some holes in them, but by and large, this is what it looks like. When you use a combustion catalyst, what you see is that a lot of the stuff inside has been hollowed out. All that carbon that was in here, uh, you, know, you can see it here, all this carbon that was inside actually burned and provided heat. So this fuel oil here that was treated with organometallic combustion catalysts used in ATX, uh, whoever was burning this fuel got more heat and better combustion out of that fuel oil. So there's a big difference. So in here, less carbon, better combustion here. Big difference. You can measure the uh, reduction and you can measure the benefits by looking at the percentage of, of unburned carbon in the same kind of fuel oil that is first burned with nothing in it, basically, and then with different kinds of organometallic combustion catalysts. The untreated fuel had about 1.35% eh, unburned carbon. When, when it's burned under the same conditions, but a iron combustion catalyst is used, you get a 60% reduction in unburned carbon, which means all of this carbon here, from here all the way down to here, <clears throat> that, that has been burned and has produced heat and is providing work, basically. If you use a calcium combustion catalyst, about the same difference, 62% significant reduction. If you take iron and you add a dispersion to it, what they found is you get a little bit better. You get 66% reduction. Um, if you take the uh, the multiple combustion catalysts that are in ATX in one of the ATX formulations like ATX 1005 SSD, which is optimized for heavy marine ships, you get an 88% reduction in unburned carbon. Uh, so uh, marine users of ATX 1005 see a see significantly better combustion with their marine fuel oil. And that should be obvious, that should provide obvious positive benefits for you as a marine fuel oil user. Now, we talked about pre-combustion and we talked about combustion. What about post-combustion problems? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're talking about post-combustion problems in this context, you're mainly talking about corrosion issues. And corrosion issues are a major concern for marine fuel oil users. Now, um, you've got high temperature and low temperature. This is an example of a piston crown, which has been exposed to high temperature corrosion over time. And you can see that the metallic surface has been compromised in ways that it should not. It, this piston crown has experienced uh, <clears throat> significant corrosive damage to it. Um, here you can see, remember, the same kind of ship that we were looking at earlier. We talked about those piston crown deposits. Well, this is the same kind of ship, same kind of corrosive damage uh, that, that has been caused. Um, Again, if you look at uh, some valves and some other areas like the nozzle rings and these exhaust valves, these have all experienced significant deposit problems and corrosion problems. So, what you know, and all of this, we keep saying all of this is fuel related. It stems from fuel characteristics. Well, why is high temperature corrosion fuel related? Well, <clears throat> um, we kept, we first we have to start with the consideration that fuel composition. Uh, is a primary causal contributor to high temperature corrosion problems. Specifically, when we're talking about fuel composition, what we're referring to is the inorganic makeup in it. You know, we're not talking about the carbon content. What we're talking about is the content of things like vanadium and sodium and iron and calcium, things like that. 
So all fuel oil, because it comes from crude, it all contains inorganic content like, you know, like sodium and vanadium and iron and sulfur, and most importantly, vanadium here. Now, during combustion, these, uh, these inorganics, they're oxidized. They're combined with oxygen, and then they start to combine with each other. And they form a bunch of different, what we might term oxide complexes, a bunch of different combinations of, of, of different things. And the thing to look at here um, is that they all have different physical characteristics and they have different melting points. So if you look at a, uh, you know, a pentasodium vanadyl vanadate, which looks like this, it's going to melt at around, you know, 535 degrees centigrade. If you compare that to a simple uh, ferric vanadate or a sodium sulfate, you know, their melting points are, you know, 300, 350 degrees centigrade higher. And what that means <clears throat> is that a, a, an inorganic complex like this is a lot more likely in the combustion zone to be in liquid form than a sodium sulfate or a ferric vanadate is likely to be. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because it influences, first of all, what their physical characteristics are going to be like when they cool down. But more importantly for our purposes, uh, they Im basically influences how corrosive those deposits are. You know, you can take and make a rather complicated graph where you track, for example, the ratio of the, the fuel oil's content of vanadium and sodium. <clears throat> and if you look at the kinds of things that are formed when that when the fuel oil containing you know this ratio here when the fuel oil is burned it's going to form these kinds of things and it's basically these kinds of things are going to have different melting points now you can see that it's not a a clean you know uniform line that goes like let's say from here to here it looks like this right i mean it's very easy to see and without over analyzing this uh, what what you want to take away from this is that um, if the fuel oil has a vanadium sodium ratio that is within certain areas, like between one and ten, let's say, um, you you've got a lot like a, a lot greater likelihood of having corrosive damage from things like slagging corrosion and corrosion of places like superheaters. So the fuel oils. In, inorganic content very much influences how corrosive the products of combustion of that fuel oil are likely to be. So these corrosive deposits, how are they formed? Well, you get, we say that V2O5 and sodium, you know, Na2OA, sodium oxides, those are formed during combustion. Um, you could substitute a couple of other different kinds as well, because as you saw before, there are a number of different kinds of you know, these complicated uh, oxide complexes that are formed. But for our purposes, we'll just select these. So um, uh, a, a, a V2O5 and a sodium oxide's formed. Um, and when they're formed, they start to react with each other and they start to attract other ash particles that have been formed. And those ash particles, they mix with these and uh, these act as binding agents. The sodium, the NaO2 acts as a binding agent the V2O5 uh, becomes reactive, and when it's all said and done, what you have is you have a liquid deposit that's being formed on the, the, uh, the, the, the metal surface that's going to combine with things like magnetite, which is an iron complex, and it's going to rapidly oxidize and it's going to corrode that metal surface. So this hot corrosion problem, this, this corrosion that happens near the combustion zone. This is a big problem that causes or contributes to those things that you were seeing earlier. So, uh, you know, given that this is a problem, something has to be done, whether it's to um, <clears throat> prevent it while it's occurring or to prevent it before the fact. So what are the best practices to keep this from happening? Well, the best practice is you use magnesium. Magnesium has been the traditional solution in the industry for decades. And the reason why it has been the traditional solution is because it's highly effective at combating corrosion problems. I mean, magnesium is good stuff when it comes to solving this kind of issue. Um, first thing it'll do is it'll mix with all of those things that are combining and it'll actually change 
their physical characteristics. It'll, in, it'll basically insert itself. And when it does that, it modifies the ash. That's why they call it an ash modifier. And it increases their melting points, which means they're a lot less likely to be liquid in the combustion zone, in the hot zone. A lot less likely to be liquid, which means that they're going to be, you know, the, the, the physical characteristics when they cool down is they're not going to be hard and glassy. They're going to be powdery. They're more likely to be able to be removed during the course of regular engine operation. And if these deposits are removed, then that means they're not there to catalyze things and cause problems. Magnesium also acts as an acid, acid neutralizer. We haven't even talked about sulfur content in the fuel. Sulfur content in the fuel, again, when that fuel is burned, that sulfur doesn't just disappear. It's got to go somewhere. And typically what happens is that uh, it combines with oxygen uh, from the air and it forms uh, either sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide. And the sulfur trioxide, this SO3, is what typically causes uh, what, what they would deem cold end corrosion problems because uh, it, will it will at some point end up combining with water and forming sulfuric acid. Well, if you add magnesium to the mix, this mag the magnesium that you add will combine with the SO3 before that happens. And what you'll get is this innocuous magnesium sulfate formed instead of this tremendously damaging sulfuric acid. So, Magnesium fuel treatments have been the traditional and the effective solution for marine fuel oil uh, corrosion problems. Um, and they've been around such a long time that we know a lot about what the proper dose rate is, which means it's not, uh, you know, it's not science or, it's, uh, or, or a shot in the dark as far as how much do I need to use. We already know how much we need to use. Typically, you'll take uh, you know, if, if you've got one molecule of V2O5, remember that. Um, if you add three molecules of magnesium to it, so in other words, three parts of magnesium for every two parts of vanadium content in the fuel, uh, you, what you'll get is you'll take a, a, a deposit that had a melting point typically of below 700, and you add magnesium to it, you get this, which has a melting point that's, uh, you know, almost, well, it's not almost, it is a good 500 degrees higher. And so this is going to be a big step towards uh, helping to remediate some of the, the problems caused by those harmful vanadate deposits. Um, now, corrosion is not only a problem in high temperature, it's a problem, as we said, in low areas for the reason that we alluded to before. If you get SO3 that's formed, SO3 eventually condenses with water and that will form sulfuric acid and that will cause uh, what they call cold end corrosion or they may call it low temperature, but it's basically cold end corrosion problems um, where the sulfuric acid uh, condenses out of the air and condenses onto those metal surfaces and basically eats away at them. Now, the operator doesn't want cold end corrosion uh, you know, because you know, the operator has a very uh, difficult and fine line to walk here. Um, the operator, first and foremost, gets as much efficiency out of the system as possible. However, because of the nature of how these things work, um, <clears throat> sometimes you have a seek to get as much efficiency as possible, you also end up with corrosion problems. So what the operator is having to do, the operator is having to try and balance getting as much efficiency out of the system while also, uh, you know, keeping corrosion problems at a minimum. Um, and one of the, the ways, well, one of the things that they have to balance is the dew point temperature. Now, dew point uh, is basically the temperature at which vapor from air turns into liquid. It's called dew point because we all know what happens in, in nature when you, uh, you, know, have, you have water vapor and the, the nighttime air cools and eventually it reaches the dew point and all that you know, water comes out and ends up on the grass. You know, we've all seen that. Now, um, if you have a gas stream, uh, a combustion gas stream, 
Uh, and that combustion gas stream has uh, SO3, sulfur trioxide. Then eventually it will have sulfuric acid vapor in it. Now, it's sulfuric acid vapor because it's in gaseous form. Now, as it travels away from the combustion zone, it's going to start cooling down, right? It left the, the combustion area at a very, very high temperature, and then it starts to cool down. If it cools down below the dew point for that particular gas mixture, then that sulfuric acid is going to turn from vapor to liquid. It's going to end up on those metal surfaces, and the operator and the, the plant operator is going to get low temperature corrosion problems. So he, has, he or she has to think, well, how do I prevent that from happening? Well, there are a couple of options on the operational end that they could try to do. Um, uh, first thing they could do is play around with the oxygen level. Now, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, oxygen in this case, uh, when we say oxygen level, uh, what we mean is the amount of air that the, uh, the operator is supplying in the combustion zone. Uh, you know, they can increase volumes of air and pump a greater volume of air in that in that zone, and they will get, uh, you know, that will mean that they're supplying more oxygen because the the uh, uh, the uh, combustion process needs oxygen needs an optimal amount of oxygen in order to be as complete as possible. Um, so uh, the operator knows this, but what the operator also knows is that the more oxygen that you supply in that area, you have more oxygen available to combine with the sulfur that's present in that fuel oil. Um, so what the operator may reason is the operator may say, well, if I can reduce the amount of oxygen that's present, I will get less sulfur dioxide that's formed. Less sulfur dioxide typically means less sulfur trioxide, which means less overall sulfuric acid uh, formation. So the operator knows this, and so he knows that there's a trade-off. He And what, what he or she wants to do, is he wants to give as much oxygen as possible that's necessary to get complete combustion, but they doesn't want to go over that because the more you go over that means the more oxygen that's available to uh, form this, you know, basically to eventually form sulfuric acid. So that's one balance that he's got to do. But another balance he's got to do is he's got to, um, <clears throat> he's got to try and maintain the temperature of the gas stream above the acid dew point. So, um, if the acid, let's say the acid dew point is 150 degrees centigrade. Um, let's say that under normal circumstances, the, the exhaust gas stream leaves the combustion zone at 300 degrees centigrade. I mean, we're just throwing out figures here for an example. So one that leaves at 300 degrees centigrade means it's got 150 degrees of space to cool down before it hits the dew point and all that acid comes out. Um, it, let's say the operator could make it 500 degrees. Well, then you have a 350 degree space. In other words, you've got a lot less chance of, of hitting that dew point. Um, and were it that simple, then you know, life would be great. However, it's not always that simple because in order to make that temperature uh, higher, the only way that the operator can really do that is by uh, having a greater air volume, essentially increase, essentially doing this, remember, increasing the amount of excess oxygen. So <clears throat> if the operator increases the amount of excess oxygen to keep the temperature higher, the trade-off is they produce more SO2, SO3, and it's a, there's a chance that they may produce a greater amount of, of um, sulfuric acid, which would actually influence the dew point. And now you start to get a headache because you're thinking that there's all these things that the operator uh, has to take into account. And if they do one thing, it's, you know, if they try to get one benefit, then they're going to have a problem in another area. And it's almost like a darned if you do, darned if you don't type of situation. And so there's no easy solution to this. You do one thing, you get an alternate problem. And the pro possible areas that you can have this corrosion, corrosive damage, if it's hot corrosion, it's typically going to manifest on the exhaust valves, uh, piston crowns, and the turbocharger. 
But for cold corrosion, <coughs> excuse me, for cold corrosion, you can get it in a lot of the exhaust areas, the trunking and the economizers. But you can also get in places like the piston crowns and the cylinder liner walls. And so if you are an operator, um, we we would ask this question: How much are corrosion problems costing you? But if you've been if you're an operator and you've been in the business for any amount of time, you know what the answer to that. It's costing you a heck of a lot. It's costing you enough that you're you're you're. If someone says that there are solutions to being able to ease that problem, you're going to listen because you know as an uh, as a marine uh, operator that corrosion problems are something that are worth paying attention to. So uh, we said hot corrosion can happen in the turbocharger. This is a turbocharger from a Sulzer. Um, <clears throat> and what you can see is you can see corrosive damage in areas of, the, of the, the, the fan here, where the exhaust air was forced, uh, was, was, was taken to help drive the turbocharger. The exhaust air contained sulfuric acid vapor and that is what caused corrosion in this turbocharger. Uh, here you can see, you know, another turbocharger, same kind of problem, corrosive damage on these fins. And this is going to be an expensive problem to fix when this corrosive damage happens. Um, cold corrosion, you can see significant cold corrosion here in this economizer. Corrosion, you know, these are all the fins that facilitate uh, heat transfer. <clears throat> this economizer here really got eaten up by cold corrosion problems. Um, another economizer being damaged by exhaust gas that had uh, a high acid content. So these are all serious problems here. Uh, we have exhaust valves. Uh, in this uh, exhaust valve seating area here, you can see all this corrosive damage that happened because of high acid content in the exhaust uh, uh, gas stream. And this is an exhaust valve itself that was pulled out. Again, this exhaust valve, you can see how big it is, first of all. And so how much is it going to cost to replace something like this? Well, again, if you've been in the industry for any amount of time, you know <clears throat> that this uh, is a major repair that's going to cost a significant amount of money. You know how much it's cost to get a new one of these, and how much it's going to cost for this guy or whoever it is to replace it. But what about the lost downtime that that ship is not producing revenue? Um, you know, and that that that's not even counting if a problem like this manifests during uh, during a job essentially, and you have a problem actually uh, fulfilling what you know you 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 have a problem finishing a job. So. Um, you know, corrosion problems are something that the industry definitely pays attention to and is definitely interested in listening to if there are solutions for that. Um, so when we start asking the questions, you know, what can we do to neutralize corrosion? We go back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Magnesium is the traditional um, uh, industry standard treatment to neutralize corrosion. <clears throat> um, uh, magnesium fixes high temperature corrosion because, as we said, it changes the melting points of the ash deposits. It also fixes low temperature corrosion because it helps neutralize the formation of SO3 and sulfuric acid. And we say all this because not only do ATX multifunctions have those combustion catalysts that we talked about before, but they also have oil-soluble magnesium. And the oil-soluble magnesium in the ATX provides the magnesium necessary to reduce both high and low temperature corrosion. And so if you use ATX, what are you going to see? Well, from the combustion catalyst, you're going to see less unburned carbon deposits and less engine wear. And uh, you're going to see a greater uh, economizer cleanliness, you know, reduction of unburned carbon in all of those areas. But you're going to see very significantly reduction in high and low temperature corrosion issues. Um, the magnesium that, that is contained in <clears throat> the ATX uh, uh, formulations, it differs from traditional magnesium because traditional magnesium, the old uh, cheap solution used to be using a magnesium oxide sl uh, slurry, what they would call magox. 
And um, <clears throat> it was cheap uh, and relatively easy to procure, but came with significant operational problems. Well, the magnesium that ATX uses is uh, what they call oil soluble. What that means is you're not going to get uh, uh, magnesium deposit dropouts in areas. You're not going to get all this slurry getting everywhere. And it's going to be highly effective at acting on the ash deposits um, and, and neutralizing the, the, uh, the, the hot and the cold and corrosion. So ATX users... In the marine industry, they see reductions in ash deposits, reductions in carbon deposits on exhaust valves and turbochargers. They're going to see reductions in unburned carbon all around, all the way around. They're going to see less unburned carbon in the economizers. <clears throat> and very importantly, the economizers are going to stay cleaner for longer, which means the, uh, you know, the service intervals – uh, that are necessary to maintain the efficiency of those kind of parts are going to be pretty significantly reduced. So all of these problems, you know, we talked about sludge formations. We talked about combustion issues. We talked about um, things like emissions. We talked about water and moisture. And we talked about hot and cold and co corrosion. Um, the recommendation that Bell Performance has for a marine user that's experiencing these problems is to try one of the ATX multifunctions. We have two marine formulations, 1004 DSC and 1005 SSD. <clears throat> the, the, the SSD actually stands for slow screw diesel. It's one of the marine formulations that we uh, came up with a number of years ago. And they contain all of the multifunction ingredients that a marine fuel oil user would need to uh, uh, solve these problems and keep them from coming, uh, uh, from manifesting themselves in the past. So this is an economizer that was uh, in a ship that used ATX. Note how this economizer looks compared to uh, you know, there's a couple of economizers just that we saw previously. Remember that economizer that had, you know, this whole area was practically eaten away from corrosive damage? Note the contrast between this one, which has been, uh, uh, had fuel oil treated with ATX, versus that previous one <clears throat> that did not. There should be a big, big noticeable difference there. Um, ATX helps solve piston crown deposits, uh, or excuse me, piston crown corrosion problems. You can see here, this piston crown here looks pretty much like it needs to, or like it should. Um, this is from a ship that uh, was uh, burning fuel oil, marine fuel oil, that was treated with ATX. Um, so how much is this shipping company saving by not having to replace this piston, by not having that to fix a piston crown corrosion problem? I'd say it's a pretty significant saving. And look at these, uh, these piston rings. These piston rings, uh, again, from a ship that burned marine fuel oil that was treated with ATX, um, these piston rings basically look clean as a whistle. And again, how much is it going to save them to not have to deal with this problem? I would say a pretty good, pretty goodly amount. <clears throat> so um, when, when we recommend AT, when the ATX multifunctions to a marine fuel oil customer, we typically recommend that they start out with a dosage between 1 to 3,000 and 1 to 4,000. So it's formulated to be fairly economical to use. Now, um, if they have uh, marine fuel oil that happens to have a higher vanadium content, we would use a higher dosage because you need to get more magnesium in there. But typically, we would look at the fuel specifications, and if that kind of thing became apparent, well, then you know we we uh, would would suggest a different treat rate to start with. Um, ATX can be dosed into a number of areas. It can be dosed into the settling tank. Or it can be uh, added by direct injection into the fuel line. Um, typically, if you were using direct injection, well, then you would use an injection system that had a fuel transfer or, or excuse me, a, an additive pump that uh, uh, would read the, uh, the, the amount of fuel that's being used and would adjust the metering of the uh, additive accordingly. There are a number of options to effectively use 
uh, ATX uh, multifunction treatments for marine fuel oil. So what kind of people uh, would be most interested or would find the most benefit in using ATX in marine fuel oil? Well, uh, the ATX family of treatments um, are used by all sorts of heavy fuel oil users. There's a lot of people in the industrial and power gen area who have used heavy fuel oil, <clears throat> both large and small. Um, given that the, the ingredients of ATX center on combustion improvement uh, and efficiency improvement and sludge reduction, and you know the reduction in deposit, you know deposit remediation, and also you know remediation of hot and cold corrosion. You might think that uh, it wouldn't. It, you might think that it has less universal appeal than it actually does. But if you think about it, that's not the case because virtually any heavy fuel oil user, whether you're in the marine sector or whether you're uh, on land, so to speak, you know. All of them basically have the same, they all want the same things, right? They want to save money. They want to reduce their fuel usage while maintaining or increasing their output. So when we say output for a, for a large marine ship, the output is how far can you travel on a ton of fuel oil? For a glass factory in Taiwan, it's how many bottles can you make on a ton of fuel oil or whatever. They all want to save money by reducing their fuel usage relative to their output. They also all have a very strong incentive to protect the capital investment of their equipment by reducing the damage that's related to the fuel. And they all pretty much want to lose as little fuel value to, to, to sludge as possible. So they all want to recover any lost fuel value that they would have lost uh, uh, and to do that through sludge dispersal. So all these users, it, 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 their businesses may look different, but they all seek the same kind of solutions. And uh, ATX multifunctions for for marine fuel oil and for heavy fuel oil, address all, you know, they satisfy the needs and wants of all of those diverse kinds of users. Now, in marine fuels, ATX fuel treatments have the potential to bring substantial benefits. Um, if you're using it in a large ship, you can get uh, fuel savings that can approach 1% or more. We tend to be in our promise. Um, we know that there are a lot of people out there that, uh, you know, the, for lack of a better way to put it, there are a lot of people out there who think that marine ship owners don't know their business as well as they do, which is a gigantic mistake. Marine, you know, if you've been in the industry for a long time, you know your ship better than anybody else. So someone like us, you know, given that we've been in business since 1909, um, <clears throat> excuse me, given that we've been in business since 1909, um, uh, we, we, we would never promise, uh, you know, outrageous fuel savings of, you know, 10% or 25% because we know that that's not credible and we know that it's not realistic, but it is realistic to expect a improvement in, uh, fuel savings of, you know, let's say 1%, which if you know the financials of what your system uses, you know, that 1% is a, a very sizable return on investment. Um, ATX fuel treatments in marine fuels help uh, uh, reduce corrosion and help um, uh, with the, uh, the problematic deposits. So you get savings there. You get reductions in maintenance costs, you, and you get uh, prevention of damage. Um, and sludge removal helps re – ATX helps recapture lost fuel value, um, reduces the amount of fuel value that's lost uh, during the centrifuging process. So. Um, we've been through a lot. Uh, we've gone through a lot of different things. Hopefully, what you will have been able to see is that there's significant value in uh, what ATX in the marine fuel oil sector can do for you. Um, <clears throat> there are probably a number of questions that uh, will arise from this because there's no possible way for us to have been able to cover all of the nuances. But hopefully, the bottom line here is that you will have been able to at least uh, reach a starting point 
where you can see that yes, there's there there are some legitimate things that you can do to to solve marine fuel oil problems, and hopefully you will be able to see that some of the value propositions that are offered by marine fuel oil treatments uh, in the ATX product line from Bell Performance, hopefully you'll be able to see that those might be worth exploring a little more. So at this point, um, this, th this, this brings us to the conclusion of our presentation here. Now, if you have any questions, best thing for you to do is to email me, my email address here on the screen, ebjornstad, at bellperformance.net. Send me an email if you have any questions. I will do my best to help you as best I can. Hopefully we have given you some food for thought here. And uh, I just wanna say thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to do that for you today. So uh, that concludes our presentation on marine fuel oil treatment um, and uh, you know marine fuel oil uh, and engine problems related to that. Thanks very much for joining me. I'm Eric Bjornstead with Bell Performance and see you next time.